good evening class a quick recap of what we have done yesterday yesterday we majorly covered the dimensions of climate change and in that aspect of climate change i think we had started off with respect to coral reefs then from there we went on to discuss about various dimensions of cryosphere climate change arctic amplification blue ocean events right i think that's where we had started discussing and from there we went on to discuss about some species also right and i think we discussed about five five six species yesterday we will not be able to discuss about much species today because today everything is biodiversity and pollution right it is everything is pollution today and biodiversity in biodiversity we are going to see number of environmental legislations and in that context i thought i will not keep species today because there is already too much of facts right so that is the thing that we are going to get into the discussion today today majorly we'll have don't worry today we have less slides we'll go slowly because there is mostly dictation which goes on sometimes right because today i'll have to cover number of reports certain observations certain legislations certain nitty gritties and certain catches that are existing in certain legislations of environment so that today's session is little slow and relaxed not like yesterday's but tomorrow's session will be yesterday's was rapid today's is normal tomorrow's is rapid rapid it will be double rapid right so we'll see getting into the business the first thing that is talking about is sky glow now you might get a doubt sir sky always glows now fundamentally you have to understand this glow is because of the additional light now you see over me how many lights are there right this is what light pollution now if i feel like sleeping also i will not sleep why three lights here two lights here now just imagine a species like me only can't sleep can species like an animal sleep no that means what is happening fundamentally the nocturnal characteristic features of the animals are lost there is one particular phenomenon that is existing here what is called as photoperiodism there is one particular phenomena which is called as photoperiodism or there is one more phenomena called as phototropy now when you talk about photoperiodism it fundamentally talks about what is the nature of the metabolism or how is the metabolism of an individual species varying according to the light and when we say photo photo simply means what my dear light now here we know that certain species are normal living and certain species are nocturnal living and when i talk about this nocturnal species nocturnal species are those species which are living or which have most of their nights being very very active most of your nocturnal beings yes yes or no ellarlu vadukuntar ratrante em chestaru so what is happening here his photoperiodic dimensions are being missed out in that context so just understand that then one more thing that you'll have to understand in this context of sky glow to a larger extent is the tree growth can also be affected because of this most of you might think that tree growth is fundamentally dependent upon photosynthetic activity and we know one specific characteristic feature that is existing in the context of photosynthetic activity is we see that the curve of the photosynthetic activity would lie something like this and be it when you talk about this is photosynthetic activity this can be either with respect to carbon dioxide or this can be either with respect to temperature or this can be either with respect to the light right what do we generally think we generally see that whenever we see higher incidence of light being present we think the photosynthetic activity is going to rampantly increase but when we observe these things what is going to happen is there is a particular threshold level after which even if there is an increase in the light even if there is an increase in the carbon dioxide even if there is an increase in the temperature that is existing what is happening is the extent of photosynthetic activity is going to reduce so in this context you have to fundamentally understand that because of this artificial light because of this light pollution we see even the photosynthetic activity of a plant species being affected please remember it is not only the animal species but also the plant species can be affected now what is this phototropy phototropy a classic example of phototropy is sunflower when you look at sunflower what happens whenever whichever direction the sun rises that side your sunflower turns that is phototropy okay so this is one basic understanding that you will have to have here can it affect human beings yes you would have heard about something called as earth hour what is earth hour what do we do we fundamentally in earth hour what do we do we switch off 
all the lights and why do we switch off all the lights one dimension is conserving the energy the other dimension is reducing the proportion of artificial light in the sky right so that is one dimension that you'll have to understand next plastic gomorrah right plastic gomorrah what is that a plastic plus agglomerate severna dirga sandhi plastic plus agglomerate it's an agglomerate which is being present because of plastic that means what is happening you see that the plastic is going to be a binding factor that is existing among different rocks different entities different geomorphological entities which are existing now when i get to understand this dimension of plasto i mean this plastic agglomerate or when i talk about the aggregate or agglomerate of plastic what do i commonly understand here i see that one dimension that i'll have to understand is plastic fundamentally has a large shelf life and i also have to understand that plastic is non biodegradable to a larger extent it is more non biodegradable now we see that one particular research has been going on where they talk about something called as bioplastics and when we look at this bioplastics now most of your you would have seen this green colored dustbin covers dustbin varte dan ko ka cover generally we use black color but aajkal kuch trend chal raha hai green color dustbin covers those green color dustbin covers are what my dear bioplastics are usko chodo instamart instamart right or blinkit zepto jo bhi covers hai na wo sara bahut weak weak covers hai they can be easily torn and when you look at this these are fundamentally bio bioplastics and what is the advantage of bioplastics these are majorly biodegradable and you you can also see that the bioplastic can be treated with microorganisms can be treated with microorganisms and we see that there is a decomposable factor which is existing in the context of bioplastics otherwise in the context of general plastics in the context of normal polythene polypropylene or whichever kind of you talk about polystyrene or pmma whichever kind of plastic that is existing or you talk about pus or pvcs whatever we generally see that they don't have a factor of decomposition but whereas in the context of bioplastics i see there is a factor of decomposition which is existing and i definitely see that in the context of the trends of upsc every year there is one question being asked on plastics and polymer ab man lo if you look at 2019 wala question paper there is a question on microplastics if you look at 2020 wala question there is a question on benzene right there is a question on benzene if you look at 2021 there was a question on polycarbonate that is especially the application of bisphenol a right what was it resulting in it is resulting in polycarbonate if you look at 2022 there was a question on polyethylene terephthalate pet we call pet bottles what is that pet bottles what is that pet in pet bottles it is not they are not called as pet bottles because they are small but pet is the material which is used for making that particular plastic bottle that is polyethylene terephthalate right and we see that one peculiar trend that has been being built up in the context of polyethylene terephthalate is we are extracting fibers from pet and we are even going for deriving textiles from pet we are also going for laying roads with respect to pet please understand this fundamental dimension right so definitely there is one question which is being asked by upsc in the context of plastics and polymers at any cost okay that is the reason why i am talking about this there is also one more small concept which has been emerging in the recent past is what is called as plastic oil is what is called as plastic oil now when i talk about plastic oil what is fundamentally happening in this context is when i look at the plastic waste which is being agglomerated and when i subject this plastic waste to higher temperatures as well as higher pressure condition what is going to happen is i see a viscous kind of liquid is going to be extracted now that viscous liquid which is being extracted because of the treatment of the plastic with higher temperatures and higher pressure is what is called as plastic oil and one specific characteristic feature that you will have to remember in the context of plastic oil is you see that this plastic oil has a high calorific value you know that calorific value fundamentally determine what is the levels of combustion that it can result in right you would have heard about something called as octane numbers and cetane numbers when you look at octane numbers it is with respect to the levels of combustion levels of calorific value that is existing with respect to petroleum and when you look at cetane numbers what are cetane numbers cetane numbers are those which are related to the calorific value of diesel right in that similar manner we also see that plastic oil also has a level of calorific value which has a potential for combustion process 
So that is one more dimension that you will have to understand here in this context of plastic agglomerate. One more thing that you will have to see is we have something called as microplastics. And when you look at this concept of microplastics, it is fundamentally size specific. And when you look at this size specific, it talks about whenever it is less than 5 mm, mm whenever it is less than 5 mm, I classify it as, I classify it as microplastic. And I see that anything can be a source of microplastic and anything can be an effect of microplastic. You fundamentally have to understand that this microplastic can, can turn into a biotoxic or cytotoxic metal or cytotoxic element. What do you mean by biotoxic or cytotoxic element? Biotoxic is that element which is having some levels of toxicity when it comes to the interaction with body, when it comes to interaction with the living organisms. And when we talk about cytotoxicity, we see there is an element of cytotoxicity that is existing in the context of microplastics. And when I look at this cytotoxicity, what do you mean by cyto? Cyto means cell. So when you see this microplastic interacting with your cells, we see there is an element of toxicity which is present. Right? So this is one small dimension that you will have to understand in the context of plastics and plastic glomerate. Right? Now, what are the measures that we have taken in the context of plastic? We talked about banning of single-use plastic. Right? We talked about banning of single-use plastic. Did we talk about banning of complete plastic or only single-use plastic? Only SUP, single-use plastic. And we also see something called as plastic waste management rules. We see plastic waste management rules were there. And for the initial times, it was there in 2016. Although they came up in 2011, then in 2012, then in 2016. What is the categorical change that happened in the context of 2016 plastic waste management rules? Is that initially it was applicable only to urban areas. But on a later date, we see the plastic waste management rules 2016 were even being applied to the rural centers, were even being applied to the rural centers. So that is one small that, that which has been brought in. Then apart from that, we also see that in the recent plastic waste management rules 2022, there is one particular change which has been brought in in the context of essential or extended producer responsibilities. We see EPR as a provision existing. And we not only see EPR as a provision existing only for e-waste, but it is also existing for plastic waste. What is EPR? Exchange or extended producer responsibilities. To simply explain to you, I keep telling this example, that when you were kids, right? Parents used to sell you to get, uh, send you to get these cool drinks. And when you used to go and get the cool drink, what happens? If the cool drink was 10 rupees, the shopkeeper used to take 12 rupees. Or don't say, sir, for cooling. What he used to tell you? He used to tell you, return the bottle, I'll give you the two rupees back. That is a form of extended producer responsibility. That means what? The producer responsibility does not end by merely production of the product, but it also is extended towards what? Extended towards the treatment of the waste that is generated from that product. So that is what is meant by extended producer responsibility. And we see that has been present in the context of plastic waste as well. Right? So remember this dimension. And... I would want you to refer to the stats which are present in the context of plastic waste management rules where they keep giving about something called as 75 micron, 120 micron, 150 micron, right? They keep talking about different sizes of plastic. Now tell me one thing, why are they categorically looking into increasing the size of the plastic? Easier collection is one and the probability of shredding, what do you mean by shredding? Shedding fundamentally means breaking them into small pieces. Shedding is an activity where you break them into small pieces. And we see that the probability of shredding of a plastic which is thicker is less. Now, when I see that the probability of shredding of a particular material which is thick is less, I definitely know the menace of microplastics is tackled. So that is the fundamental reason why they talk about increasing the size or increasing the thickness of the plastic. The reason why they increase is to reduce the menace of micro plastics. So that is one small dimension that I would want you to understand here. Right? Next. So that means a thicker plastic is better or a thinner plastic is better? Thicker plastic. Right? At least these Raghavendra Tiffins, Siddhartha Tiffins, Udupi Tiffins and all, now they, they give you thicker white cover. Yes or no? Thinat leather and thin. You have thinat leather. Ah? Fasting. Ah.
నీ మొహాలు చూసి అస్సలు అనిపించట్లేదు ఫాస్టింగ్ అంట ఫ్లై యాష్ వాట్ ఈస్ ఫ్లై యాష్ యాష్ విచ్ ఈస్ ఫ్లయింగ్ వై ఈస్ ఇట్ ఫ్లయింగ్ బికాస్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఫ్లయింగ్ రైట్ నా వెన్ యూ లుక్ అట్ ఫ్లై యాష్ ఇట్ సింప్లీ మీన్స్ నాట్ యాష్ విచ్ ఈస్ ఫ్లయింగ్ వై ఆర్ మై టెల్లింగ్ యాష్ విచ్ ఈస్ ఫ్లయింగ్ ఐ సీ దాట్ when ever there is a combustion process which is being undertaken in the context of coal i see that there are some emissions which are present and i see a kind of sooty substances are released a kind of sooty substances are released and when i find the sooty substances which are being released this sooty substance is what is called as fly ash this sooty substance is what is called as fly ash sooty substance and end amma masi exactly that brown black right we have something called as black carbon brown carbon you would have heard what is the difference between black carbon and brown carbon what is the difference the fundamental difference between black carbon and brown carbon is the degree of combustion wherever we see it is an incomplete combustion we majorly see it is brown carbon which is existing what is the dimension with respect to blue carbon what is blue carbon the carbon which is stored in the portions is what is called as blue carbon that is where we see the carbon sequestration process right black carbon and brown carbon are something which are related to the combustion process whereas blue carbon is something which is related to carbon which is stored in carbon sinks now once i understand that basic dimension now here you will have to understand one very very important dimension of coal now when we look at coal what do we commonly observe in the context of coal is i see that in the context of indian coal there are different types of coals which are present starting with anthracite bituminous lignite and peat i know that anthracite is also present in the context of india and most of the time anthracite is present in the regions of kashmir and when i look at bituminous coal bituminous coal is majorly in the context of gondwana coal i see that there are two kinds of coals which are categorically present one is the gondwana coal the other one is tertiary coal i see that the proportion of gondwana coal is much much greater than the proportion of tertiary coal in the context of india and i also see that which is more qualitative the quality is fundamentally more in the context of gondwana coal because gondwana coal is definitely older than the tertiary coal and the, when i look at the geographical presence in the context of tertiary coal most of the tertiary coal is present in the northeastern region that is one fundamental dimension that you will have to understand in the context of indian coal and when i look at the characteristic features in the context of indian coal i see that certain characteristic features are going to vary across this particular region when i move from anthracite to peat one thing is very very definite i see that the carbon level decreases the amount of carbon that is present is decreasing the amount of moisture that is present is increasing the amount of ash that is present is increasing the amount of sulfur that is present is increasing so when i look at the specific characteristic features in the context of the indian coal i see that the quality of the coal would vary depending upon what is the amount of carbon that is present and not only the amount of carbon that is present but also i see the amount of moisture content as well as the ash content which is existing now when i have to characterize indian coal i would characterize indian coal with the low fusion temperature with low fusion temperature with low carbon content high ash content high moisture content and not only high ash and high moisture but also high sulfur content this is what is the characteristic feature of indian coal and this particular question was asked more than thrice in the context of ups prelims so that is one small dimension that you will have to understand in the context of indian coal now once you see this what is happening is when i look at the fly ash i see that there are multiple applications which are seen with respect to fly ash one side i see fly ash can be a pollutant to a larger extent because why they are pollutants to a larger extent don't you think one definite effect of fly ash would be it reduces the albedo of the region yesterday we were discussing about a concept called as albedo which is nothing but the reflective capacity of a particular surface and there we are seeing what that when i look at this fly ash as a phenomena that is existing as i see the depositions of the fly ash being present when i look at the deposition of the fly ash being present what do i find i find that the albedo of that particular region automatically reduces because the black surface will absorb the radiation whereas the white surface will reflect the radiation that is what is one common understanding that we had seen so that is one dimension that you'll have to understand the other thing that you'll have to see is fly ash will also have some positive applications one positive application that can be seen in the context of fly ash is it can be used as a fertilizer it can be used as or it can be used for 
increasing the water storing capacity of the soil it can be used in making bricks it can be used in making roads it can be used for construction material i see these are the various applications which are existing in the context of fly ash now when i observe these basic dimensions which are existing in the context of the fly ash i also see one more dimension which is present with respect to fly ash if i want to reduce the proportion of fly ash there is one particular technique which has being uh, which is being used is what is called as clean coal technologies when i look at this clean coal technologies these are nothing but technologies which are fundamentally used to modify the nature of the indian coal which is existing and when you look at this clean coal technologies one peculiar clean coal technology that we see is something called as coal washing technology when i look at this coal washing technology the name itself says coal washing is what washing off coal that means i'm going to have a high pressure water gun which is going to be present and where i see the coal being supplied on the conveyor belt when the coal is being supplied on the conveyor belt and when i go for this washing what is going to happen is i would see fundamentally reduce the amount of particulate matter which is existing there then apart from that i also see something called as desulfurization of coal when i look at this desulfurization of coal what do i majorly see in the context of desulfurization of coal i try to reduce the proportion of sulfur composition that is existing in or that is a characteristic feature of indian coal the apart from that one more thing that i would want to look into the improving the efficiency of coal when i am using it in the thermal power plant yesterday we were discussing about the energy basket and we had seen over 59 percentage of the indian energy is derived from the fossil fuel based so in that context when you look at for efficient usage or for efficient utility of coal one particular dimension that i would want to ensure that there is something called as pulverization of coal and when you look at this pulverization of coal what do i mean by pulverization of coal pulverization of coal simply means breaking it into small small pieces when i break it into small small pieces one of the characteristic advantage of pulverization of coal will fundamentally increase the fusion temperature will fundamentally increase the fusion temperature will fundamentally ensure that the calorific value is being improved and not only this i also see one more kind of clean coal technology that is existing you would have heard about something called as coal bed methane cbm when you look at this coal bed methane it is not only that we are utilizing the coal which is existing in the coal bed that means when we look at this coal beds what happens is we see that there are something called as coal seams what do we call them as coal seams coal seams are nothing but those small small gaps which are existing between or which are existing in the coal bed now when we observe this coal seams what is happening is we see abundance of methane being present in this because at the end of the day you fundamentally have to understand be it any fossil fuel which is existing be it your coal be it your oil be it your gas it is fundamentally a resultant of subjecting the organic matter to high temperature and high pressure for large time period and when i see the subjecting it for high temperature and high pressure for large time period i see the longer the time period is being subjected to i see higher the carbon content which is present when i see the higher the carbon content which is present i would fundamentally get to understand that there is going to be more calorific value that is existing with respect to that fossil fuel that is the reason why we see gondwana coal being more qualitative than tertiary coal so in that context when we observe this we see the coal seams are fundamentally having this methane which is to be extracted and which is to be utilized for generations so these are some of the techniques or some of the techniques which are being used and one more thing they talk about something called as co firing technology when you look at this co firing technology what do you understand in the context of co firing technology this is one aspect to reduce the dependence of coal to reduce the dependence of coal one ironical situation that is existing in the context of coal is what my dear one ironical situation that we see in the context of coal is we know india happens to be one of the largest reserves of the coal which is existing india happens to be one of the largest reserves of the coal but one major aspect that we see is india is one of the largest importers of the coal so we see a dichotomic situation that is existing in the context of the coal scenario when it comes to india because of this this kind of scenario which is existing in india that was the reason why we went for why we went for decentralization of coal sector in 2020 before before 2020 what was the nature of the coal sector in india whole of the coal manufacturing was managed by coal india limited but in 2020 we went for talking about decentralization of coal sector there we talked about something called as captive mining there we talked about something called as captive mining of coal there we also talked about what my dear open area access right open area 
access or open acreage license policy OALP. So that means what fundamentally started happening is we see the decentralization of the coal sector started to happen. Privatization of the coal sector started to happen, right? Prior to that, what was the coal sector? Coal sector was nationalized. But after 2020, we see it is, we see it is privatized as well as decentralized. Now, keeping that in mind, when we look at those ironical situations, one major aspect that you will have to remember in the context of coal is India is import dependent in the context of coking coal. When you talk about India being import dependent on coking coal, what do you understand in the context of coking coal? Coking coal is nothing but industrial grade coal. Coking coal is nothing but industrial grade coal. That means whatever is the coal that is being used in the industries is what is considered to be coking coal. And when I look at the general composition of coking coal, the general composition of coking coal is very, very similar to the composition of anthracite, not bituminous, right? The composition of coking coal is very, very similar to anthracite type of coal, not bituminous type of coal. That is the reason why we see we have large import dependence in the context of coking coal. So that is one small dimension that you'll have to understand to a larger extent. Are you understanding? We revised whole coal. Whole coal, definitely we will have two marks. Please understand. Please understand. The reason is not chumma to show off my knowledge. If I show off my knowledge, these sessions are not sufficient. Right? We are what are we focusing on? We are fundamentally focusing on high impact areas. So what are we doing? High impact revision. Please understand. Next is pet coke. Right? What is pet coke? Coke which is pet? Huh? What is pet coke? Coke which is pet? What is pet coke? In huh? diet coke, pet coke is something related to that. Right? Pet coke is recently seen in news. It is regarding option A. It's a soft drink. It's a hard drink. It is no drink. It is something which is related to oil sector. Something which is related to oil sector, right? Kada, oka vela pet coke kuda kick kitchen than ko. Dani guda ogalru. What is the proof? During COVID, sanitizers, right? Now, when we talk about pet coke, we see that when we look at any oil sector, we see two kinds of processes existing in the context of oil sector. One is either an upstream or either a, a downstream process. Now, when you look at this upstream process or downstream process, what do I commonly observe is one particular area where I see is refineries. Is refineries. Now, when I observe these refineries, what is the technology that is mostly used in the context of refineries? It is fractional distillation process. When I talk about this fractional distillation process, what is the fundamental understanding is depending upon the temperature, the density will be varying. Depending upon the density, the, the necessary separation happens. The denser the liquid, the denser the fluid, the denser the material, it moves down the fractional column. Lighter it is, it is extracted on the upper columns of the fractional column. So in this context, what happens is we see that when we look at this fractional column of any distillery, what do we observe is the bottommost material that we collect is what is pet coke. The bottom most material that we collect is pet coke. That means what? Is it highly dense or very less dense? High density. Very, very high density. And when I observe this, what happens is, it is highly polluting in nature. If it is being extracted towards the last one fundamental understanding is whatever is left out, the scrap is all in pet coke. Now, uh, ironically, what, what happens is in the context of India, India happens to be the largest user of pet coke. And Vada is in the Vadam. Vada Kodan the Vada. Largest user of pet coke. And who is our largest supplier? USA, our beloved friend. Now, here what recently happened is India had or the government had given permission for importing something called as needle pet coke. Now, when we talk about importing of this needle pet coke, what do you understand by this needle pet coke? The pet coke which is extracted from needle-like structures. Pet coke which is extracted from needle-like structures is what is called as needle pet coke. 
And here, where are we having this needle-like structures? The needle-like structures are present somewhere in the refinery. They're somewhere present in the refinery. And when I extract this pet coke from needle-like structures, I call it as needle pet coke. That is why it is what is called as needle pet coke. Now, here you also have to understand that when you talk about this pet coke, we see that this needle pet coke, when they started or when they talked about giving permission for the import of the needle pet coke, we see that only for one application they have given, that is for lithium ion batteries. Making the anode material in lithium ion batteries is what is one fundamental application that they have gone for in the context of needle pet coke. Now, once you understand this basic dimension of needle pet coke, now that means what? Needle pet coke is banned in India or is it allowed? It's allowed. We have the largest. Consumer, who is supplying us? US, more than 40% of the pet coke is being supplied from US, right? Next. Wastewater treatment. Now, when we talk about this wastewater treatment, I see that when I talk about wastewater, it simply talks about pollution. And when I look at this water pollution yesterday, I think I had already given you an indicator of water pollution. The indicator of water pollution is biological oxygen demand. I told you higher the biological oxygen demand, I talk about higher the pollution which is existing. That is one dimension that you will have to see. The other dimension that I will see is whenever I have high biological oxygen demand, I see that there is lesser ox dissolved oxygen. That means the availability of oxygen in that particular water body is less. And in that context, I also see that the biological oxygen demand of a particular water body is dependent upon the temperature. That is where I talk about the thermal pollution of water. When I see the thermal pollution of water, what is happening? The amount of oxygen that is dissolved in that particular water body reduces. When the amount of oxygen that is existing in that water body reduces, automatically what is happening? The biological oxygen demand of that particular water body increases because I see that there is an inverse relation that is existing between biological oxygen demand and dissolved oxygen. So this is one small thing that I was telling you yesterday also in the context of the algal blooms in the context of harmful algal blooms in the context of eutrophication all of these dimensions and i think this when i discussed when i was discussing about the diagram for natural farming right this side we had one particular point which talks about reduces the probability of algae growth and in that context i would have given you this dimension now once i understand this i know that i'll have to go for purification of water when i look at the purification of water i see number of techniques which are existing one is I would go for UV treatment. And the most basic thing that we do is what, my dear? The filtering process. Another basic thing that I do is what, my dear? Reverse osmosis. Right? Reverse osmosis. And one more thing that I do is in the context of cavitation process. Or one more thing that I do, I use something called as surfactants. And one more, membrane. Membrane and your yeah, reverse osmosis is very, very similar. Membrane technology, you would have heard about something called as SPMs. What is this SPM? Semi-permeable membranes. Now, here you have to understand that in the context of filtration process of water, what do I observe? I see only the physical sediments being removed. I see the physical sediments being removed because when I look at any kind of water pollutant, I see that the water pollutant can be a physical element or water pollutant can be a biological element in the context of microorganisms or it can also be a chemical element which is existing. So when I look at this process of filtering, I see that only the physical entities of the water pollution is removed. And when I look at UV, I see that in the context of UV, majorly it is what, my dear, majorly it is biological ones. Majorly, it is biological ones. When I look at the UV radiations, I talk about biological ones being removed or the biological pollutants being removed. Why? Because I see this process is what is understood as the sterilization process. This is what is understood as the sterilization process. I hope you know that UV spectrum and each ray of UV spectrum has its own application. Be it in the context of IR radiation, be it in the context of microwave, be it in the context of... Do we have any application for gamma? What is the application for gamma? Gamma rays. Huh? Answer treatment is gamma. Some base of manchal. Honor. What is the application of gamma? No application of gamma, my dear. From where will you have an application of gamma? Gamma is supposed to be what? Ionizing radiation. When I know that gamma is an ionizing radiation, what is the biggest problem with radioactive waste? Emissions of gamma rays. 
I know that in the context of nuclear fission reaction, there are different kinds of rays which are released. One is gamma is there. I also see a process called as beta decay going on. And where I see that number of neutrinos as well as anti-neutrinos coming into the picture. So in that context, what you have to fundamentally understand, you have to understand that the radioactive pollution is dangerous for a reason. For what purpose? It is dangerous for the reason of gamma radiations. Now, when I look at X-ray, I know X-ray is used for medical treatments. I know that UV rays are used for the sterilization process. I know IR is used for heating. I know visible is used for communications. I know that micro is used for communications. I know that radio is also used for communications. You please understand these dimensions, right? UV on this electromagnetic wave spectrum is extremely important again. Please remember. Okay. Then next, in the context of reverse osmosis, what do I see? I see that fundamentally in the context of reverse osmosis, I see a variation that is existing with respect to concentration. I see a variation that is existing with respect to concentration. Maybe the chemical dimension as well as the physical pollutants of a particular water body can be removed through reverse osmosis process. And in the context of cavitation, what happens? That, or suppose say if this is the water surface. Now, when I see that if, if this is the water surface, what is generally done is the point here and the point here will have different pressure condition. When I have the different pressure condition, don't you think I see a water bubble-like structure like this? I see a water bubble-like structure like this. Now, when I see a water bubble-like structure, what is happening is I see that in this particular water bubble which is existing, I see that there is going to be a variation that is present with respect to the oxygen level in that particular bubble. I'm just taking one particular cavity here. Please understand. I'm just taking one particular cavity. What am I doing? By giving the necessary pressure difference, I'm varying the amount of oxygen that is present in that particular cavity. When I have that amount of oxygen that is present in that particular cavity is different or is varying, what do I commonly observe? I see that. I see that the water is being purified because the oxygen component or the oxygen content in that particular water body is raising. Because what was happening for polluted water, what are we having more oxygen or less oxygen? Less oxygen, less dissolved oxygen, right? Now, when you talk about biosurfactants, the name itself, this biosurfactants is majorly used for what material? It is majorly used for microorganisms. Biosurfactants is majorly used for microorganisms that is existing. Then, you know, membrane, we were discussing, membrane is with respect to your potential difference that is present, or concentration difference that is present. Then we have something called as, recently we had something called as oil leakage in Assam. Now, oil leakage in Assam, now, when we talk about this oil leakage, the context was NGT talked about giving compensation to the necessary, to the victims of the oil leakage that happened in Bagjan oil field. Where is this Bagjan oil field? It happened in Assam. Now, when you look at this oil, what fundamentally happens, my dear? We see that, is it hydrophilic or lipophilic? Oil is a lipophilic substance. It is a lipophilic substance. It is a hydrophobic substance. When it is a hydrophobic substance, does it mix with water or does it not mix with water? It doesn't mix with water. So as it does not mix with water, what is going to happen is it is going to affect the oxygen level. And not only affecting the oxygen level, it also affects the turbidity of the water. What do you mean by turbidity of the water? It is all about the clearance or the clear appearance of the water. Now when I see larger turbidity that is existing, I see lower clearance of the water which is present. I see lower transparency of the water when I see large turbidity. So in that context, what happens is I see because of this turbidity, I know the photosynthetic activity that is existing in a particular water body will vary. Because when I observe any water body, what is my simplest understanding of any water body, my dear? I know that when I look at any water body, I see that there are different surfaces which are existing in any water body. This particular region is what is called as littoral region. This particular region is what is called as limnetic region. This particular region is what is called as neretic region. This particular region is what is called as profundal region. This particular region is what is called as benthic region or abyssal region. So this is what is the order of the region that is existing. And when I look at this order of the region that is existing, be it your littoral, limnetic, neretic, profundal, or benthic or abyssal regions, what do I commonly observe? I see that most of the living or the living activity or most of the photosynthetic activity of a water body fundamentally goes on in the littoral region or limnetic region. And when I look at the categorical difference that is existing between your littoral region as well as limnetic region, is what do I see? It is what is called as littoral region because it is sunlit. 
It is what is called the littoral region because it is sunlit. And when I look at that limnetic region, limnetic region happens to be that region where I have maximum amount of the biological activity which is going on in a particular water body. Now here what happens is when I see what the oil being present, what is going to happen when the amount of sunlight penetration is going to reduce? Now when I see that the amount of sunlight penetration is going to reduce, the only thing all of these layers will shift up. When all of these layers will shift up, automatically what is going to happen? The photosynthetic activity that is existing in a particular water body is completely lost. Now when the photosynthetic activity that is existing in the water body is completely lost, what is going to happen? I see that the phytoplankton structures which are existing in the water body are demolished. When the phytoplankton structures are demolished, I know that the aquatic food chain is automatically demolished. When I find this aquatic food chain, be it your phytoplankton, then depending upon zooplankton, then your zoo on this, we have something called a small fish, then we have large fish which is dependent. Now, when I see all of this is disrupted because of the increased turbidity, because of the oil pollution, because of the reduced photosynthetic activity, that means what is happening? Whole of the ecosystem balance that is existing with respect to your aquatic ecosystems is lost. So that is one fundamental understanding that you'll have to see in the context of oil spills, right? And I think this year in GS3 also we had one question. And in GS3 we had one question, if I'm not wrong. It was question number seven or eight, something like that, right? So what did they ask you in that? They asked you, what is oil spill? What are the measures to, or what are the impacts of oil spill and what are the measures to be taken? And in this context of oil spills, you please understand, there is one small thing that you'll have to get in the context of oil spill. There is one particular technology which is used using biotechnology that is oil zapper technology. Now, when I look at this oil zapper technology, what do I commonly observe with respect to oil zapper technology? I see that it is a microorganism. It is a bacterial structure which is present. And this bacterial structure is fundamentally used for decomposition of the oil that is existing in the, in the oil spill. So that is oil zapper. Now, I know that this is a process of what, my dear, this is a process of bioremediation. I see there are multiple ways of bioremediation process that I come across. What is bioremediation process? It's a biological method of treatment of waste that is existing. And I see there is something called as in situ bioremediation, ex situ bioremediation. I see there are variants of bioremediation called as phytoremediation, mycoremediation. And when I observe this in situ remediation, what do I see in the context of in situ remediation? I see that there is something called as bioventing, bioaugmentation, biosparaging. All of these are different kinds of in situ. Whereas when I talk about ex situ bioremediation, I talk about something called as biopiling, composting mechanism. All of these are ex situ, right? So please understand. Is this in situ or ex situ? In situ, in situ simply means what? It is the it is the site of generation of waste. It is the site of generation of waste. When I observe this treatment happening at the site of the generation of waste, I call it as in situ. Ex situ is what? Outside the site of generation of the waste is what is called as ex situ remediation process, right? So this is one small thing that you'll have to remember. Bakeka, you see, Indian Coast Guard happens to be the in charge for this. A plastic overshoot day. We would have heard about something called as earth overshoot day. And you would have heard about something called as carrying capacity of earth. Now, when you talk about carrying capacity of earth, 2019 GS3, there was a 15 marker which was asked in this. Now, when you look at this carrying capacity of earth, the simplest understanding about the carrying capacity of earth is what? That how much of life the earth can support. How much of life the earth can support and what is the condition that is put here? Without degradation, without the necessary degradation that is happening, how much life can be supported by the earth? And not only the, um, the degradation factor, but the regeneration aspect. That means... How much of the life is being supported by the earth without affecting the regenerative capacity of the earth? If you don't affect the regenerative capacity and if it is supporting a particular life, if it is supporting a particular population, that is what is called as carrying capacity. That is what is called as carrying capacity. Now what is happening is when I look at the carrying capacity, I see that the carrying capacity of a particular region or a surface will fundamentally depend upon what is the amount of resources that are existing. That means what is the nature of the biotic as well as the abiotic interaction that is present. Now when I observe that biotic and abiotic interaction that is existing in that particular region, when I see there is a symbiotic relation that is existing between the biotic and the abiotic resources, I see that there is a phenomena called as ecosystem balance or ecological balance. 
Now, when I have this ecosystem balance and when I have this ecological balance, I see that there is a reciprocal interaction. There is a symbiotic interaction that is existing between biotic and abiotic and it is going to support all of the living organisms which are existing. Now, here, when there is a condition where the resources which are existing on the earth are not supporting the lives that are present on the earth, they are not able to support the lives that are present on the earth, I see that this, whenever this occurs or whichever day this occurs, I see that that is what is called as earth overshoot day. Now, earth overshoot day as a phenomenon is categorically indicating that the carrying capacity of the earth is being lost. And when I observe that the carrying capacity of the earth is being lost because of the earth overshoot day, what is the common observation is once upon a time we used to see that the earth overshoot day used to be in December. But when you look at today, it is around August. That means in one year, if it was, if the earth was supposed to support the life for one year without any damage, but now it is only able to support up to August. That means after the August as a month, what is going to happen? All of the resources are going to be exploited and it is going to be earth overshoot day. In the similar manner, I see something called as plastic overshoot day. Now, when I talk about the plastic overshoot day, what is it talking about, my dear? Whenever I see generation exceeding the management, whenever I see the generation exceeding the management, I, I call it as plastic overshoot day. Now, when I talk about this generation exceeding the management, I call it as plastic overshoot day. And when I observe this dimension, what is happening here? When I look at the waste management supply chain that is existing, I see that if there is 100 kgs of waste that is being generated, I see only 78 kgs of waste is being collected now. And when I see this 78 kgs of waste is being collected, one peculiar phenomenon that I observe is hardly 30 kgs of waste is being processed. That is what is one major issue that is existing in the context of waste management. Now, when I observe this, the amount of waste that is processed is hardly 30 percentage of the amount of waste that is generated. Now, when I observe this, that means automatically what is happening, the amount of waste that is generated is always exceeding the amount of waste that is managed. And that condition is what is called as plastic overshoot day. And there is one more index which is being given called as mismanaged waste index. And what is the ranking of India? India is ranked fourth in the context of mismanaged waste index. And when we see one more Pact which is existing, India Plastic Pact. When I talk about this India Plastic Pact, it is with respect to whom, my dear, WWF and CII. That it is with respect to WWF and CII. It is not with respect to UNEP. Please remember this. It is not with respect to UNEP, but it is with respect to World Wildlife Fund as well as CII, Confederation of Indian Industries. Green crackers. What are green crackers? Crackers which are Alana Japtu Elandi. Right? Anything that is green is what? Eco friendly and sustainable. That is one basic understanding. And when do they become eco friendly and sustainable? Whenever I stop using barium components. Whenever I stop using barium components, these become eco friendly and sustainable. One dimension. The second dimension that I'll have to understand here is whenever I use these three components, that means when I reduce the ash content and when I have smaller shells which are present, and I also see when there are additives, what kind of additives are there? The kind of additives are which are going to fundamentally reduce the amount of dust which is released. The amount of dust which is released after bursting of this particular cracker, I see, I call that particular cracker as green cracker. There was one question which was regarding green cracker in 2019. They were asked, Swas, Suffol and Star are seen in news. It is regarding what? It is regarding green crackers. Please understand that. And NERI is the organization. And NERI is branch of what matter? NERI is branch of CSIR. NERI is branch of CSIR. Who is the chairperson of CSIR? Who is the chairman of CSIR? Prime Minister. Don't forget, my dear. Which all organizations are chaired by Prime Minister? National Board for Wildlife is chaired by whom? Prime Minister, Niti Ayog, Prime Minister, Interstate Council, Prime Minister, Zonal Councils, Home Minister, beautiful. Then National Disaster Management Authority, Prime Minister, National Ganga Council, Prime Minister, yes or no? Civil Services Board, Cabinet, 
secretary cabinet secretary beautiful right then csir is headed by whom prime minister ntca is headed by whom national tiger conservation authority is headed by whom prime minister environment minister ministry of environment forest and climate change who is going to be the head of national biodiversity authority nba secretary of ministry of environment forest and climate change who is the chairperson of who is the chairperson of nba national biodiversity authority it is chaired by secretary of ministry of environment forest and climate change right who is the chairperson of animal welfare board of india ha huh? is it ministry of fisheries or is it ministry of agriculture now it's ministry of fisheries but who is the chairperson there now tell me one more thing animal welfare board of india is it a statutory organization or is it an executive organization statutory established under which act prevention of cruelty against animals act pca 1960 right pca 1960 it is not with respect to wildlife protection act please remember right ah. of cheetah reintroduction you are very very familiar that all of you were putting statuses and you were talking about what the four cubs which were born edo mere daniki janma nichinattu ha you were all discussing that you were all putting status how cute how chubby at chuchu munnu you were calling them degar kelli pilavandi tarvata pilavadaniki em undadu right so when you look at this cheetah reintroduction what is the significance of this this is the first transboundary relocation of species this is the first transboundary relocation of species is it the first relocation of species in india now we have multiple species which have been relocated for example gharials right what is the hot spot for gharials in india chambal region chambal region right how many types of crocodiles are there in india three types of crocodiles one is gharials the other one is maggar crocodile the other one is salt water crocodile what is the fundamental difference between all three the first two are fresh water crocodiles and the last one is salt water crocodile that means maggar crocodile is a fresh water crocodile gharial is a fresh water crocodile what is the status of gharial critically endangered critically endangered remember this right so we had gharial relocation we had one horned rhinoceros relocation from regions of manas to pobitoro right we see regions of manas pobitoro orang national park all of these are known for these are the hot spots which are known for one horned rhinoceros what is the status for one horned rhinoceros they are vulnerable they are vulnerable one horned rhinoceros is vulnerable right sumatran rhino it is extinct it is extinct please remember sumatran rhino is extinct right please understand this now in that context we had multiple species which were relocated we had relocation of asiatic lions asiatic lions are known in which region my dear in the gir forest girnar national park and we see something called as bunny grasslands what is the tribe which is existing there maladhari tribe which is present there maladhari tribe which is present in that region and we see asiatic lions were relocated what was the reason for relocation of asiatic lion because of the presence of cvd canine or cdv canine distemper virus because of the prevalence of canine distemper virus we see that there was a threat which was existing with respect to this asiatic lions now in the similar manner we talked about cheetah relocation now one categorical thing that you will have to remember in the context of cheetah relocation the reason why they looked into relocation of cheetah or reintroduction of cheetah is to conserve grasslands is to conserve grasslands because in the context of india we see that central india is characterized with grasslands the central india is characterized with grasslands and when the central india is characterized with grasslands we see that in this particular region when we had this predators which are less in number and when we had this flagship species which are less in number when we had this umbrella species which are less in number what fundamentally hap was happening was we see that there was the population explosion of something called as black buck which was taking place and when we have the population explosion of the black buck which is taking place we know it is one of the deer species which is present and when we look at this explosion of black buck which is existing what is happening is we know that because of the population explosion excessive consumption and excessive grazing activity was going on or was seen in the context of the central grasslands 
and in order to keep the check on the grazing in order to conserve the grasslands in the central highlands which are present in india we went on to introduce cheetahs right that was the fundamental reason here is it ex situ conservation or in situ conservation ex situ in situ how many say in situ how many say ex situ others no situ hmm? all gopis those who don't take a stand what will happen you will say sir i eliminated two options sir but 50 50 sir na daridram ento gaane sir i am choosing the wrong option sir you will choose wrong option it is not because of confusion my dear it is because of your indecisive nature and your inability to take a decision puddus remember this you have two options no your brain will be telling c your heart will be telling d your belly will be telling nothing leave this question your eyes will be telling sleep what will you do sleep ah rest in peace permanently telling you huh? take a decision my dear how many say in situ or inta cheppin tarvata kuda na ipudu ardham ayinda ya why they were calling it is not steel frame but it is rusted frame of india i think 3 days pehle we had one article in business standards where duburi subarao was talking about rusted frame of india and they said that we need what reforms why chaptunam the upsc reforms upsc will love mee valle jarugutay enduku mee valle jarugutay it is ex situ form of conservation always remember what is our basic dimension or basic understanding of ex situ my dear ex situ means when i conserve the outside of its original habitat always remember the word original habitat although it is very very similar habitat which is existing although i say it is grasslands but definitely it is not the same habitat when i am conserving it outside the original habitat i see it is what is called as ex situ conservation when i conserve it within the same habitat within the original habitat i call it as in situ for example there are different forms of in situ conservations i see something called as national parks wildlife sanctuaries sacred groves biosphere reserves tiger reserves elephant reserves community reserves conservation reserves all of these are what all of these are different forms of in situ conservation ex situ conservation i see botanical gardens your cryo preservation seed bank gene bank all of these are what ex situ conservation right so that is one small thing that you have to understand and a peculiar feature hai cheetah ke bare mein it doesn't have claws and just because it doesn't have claws that was the fundamental reason why it can accelerate faster it is one of the fastest mammals which are present theek hai next baki ka you please remember those are writing tspsc and abbsc group to remember how many cheetahs were introduced from where right south africa we have eda yadi ah south africa we had how many 12 and namibia how many 8 remember that right remember that number for those who are writing upsc if you remember this you can forget everything else right ah baki next project tiger what is the speciality of project tiger 50 years right we had finished 50 years and when we look at this project tiger majorly it is with respect to what initially it was undertaken in jim corbett what is the speciality of jim corbett the largest number of tigers are present in jim corbett and we also see it is the first tiger reserve which has been classified and we also see the highest density of tigers are present in jim corbett please understand this these three are the special features of jim corbett and for the first time the project tiger was introduced where jim corbett right so remember this now once i understand this i also know that it is endangered species now if you look at 2017 question paper there was one question regarding the schedules and it said that it is or the turtle is protected in a similar status as that of the tiger and what is the status it is endangered it is schedule 1 which is schedule 1 species which is present now once you understand this recently we had something called as your tiger census which were present when we look at this tiger census we see tiger census are released every how many years my dear four years every four years and we see that around 70% of the tiger population is present where it is present in india 
and is present in India. The tiger population increased, right? Tiger tiger population increased. And one more thing that you have to remember is what? How many tiger reserves do we have at present? We have 55. Finalize the number 55. There was a lot of confusion whether it is 53, 54, 55. Now it is 55. The 54th one was Viranga Durgavati and 55th one was Dolpur, Karoli Tiger Reserve. It is in Rajasthan. And we know M stripes, cat tracks, these are some of the mechanisms which are seen or these are some of the technologies which are used for tiger sensors. We, saw, we see, we use pug marks as well. That is one of the rudimentary technologies. Then we had GPS locations. Then we have something called as radio tagging. We have something called as radio tagging. Radio tagging tags doesn't mean you go and put an identity card around Tiger. Then they will have to put garland around you. Please. You can't. Right? Radio tagging is something which is related to GPS. Please remember this. Right? Then we see that what is the tiger population? Highest tiger population is present where? Karnataka? AP? Yo! There is only one tiger in AP. Right? So please. Ah. Which population? Batao, yaar. Why Karnataka is coming now? Madhya Pradesh, then Karnataka, then Uttarakhand. This is with respect to tiger. With respect to elephant, to what? Karnataka, Assam, Kerala. With respect to leopards, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and AP. AP and the question. AP lo leopards are there, Babu. Where are leopards in AP? Achha. Oh, Tirupati sticks. Chirutapuli. Oh. Interlinking. Huh? <laughs> we'll see. There's, there are leopard senses as well. We'll discuss. Okay. So we see what maximum is in Pandipur, then Nagarhol, then Bhandavgad, then Dudva. Then Dudva, right? So these four are the regions which are present. Now also remember that. There were regions where we did not find any tiger population. There were reserves where we did not find any tiger population. And there were states where we had seen there was a dwindling tiger population that was existing. That means if there is a statement which says that in all of the tiger reserves, we see the population of the tigers increasing. Is it right? No. No. Right? For example, Dampa Tiger Reserve. Where is Dampa Tiger Reserve? Mizoram. Right? Dampa Tiger Reserve in Mizoram. We fundamentally find what? We find that there is a decline in the tiger population which is existing. Please remember this, right? So that is one small thing that you'll have to understand in the context of tiger census. In the group, there is already a document which is shared on tiger census. Next, some initiatives. Now, in this initiatives, we see St. Petersburg Declaration. When we talk about St. Petersburg Declaration, St. Petersburg Declaration is with respect to whom, my dear? It is with respect to tiger conservation and what is it majorly related to? It is majorly related to doubling of tiger population. That is where we talk about TX2, doubling of tiger population. And when we look at this, here we see there are something called as 13 tiger range countries. There are 13 tiger range countries. Please remember these tiger range countries. There are 13 tiger range countries. There are 12 snow leopard range countries. That this year we had for the first time snow leopard census being coming into the picture. Right? And we see 70% of the snow leopards being present where? In Ladakh. In Ladakh. And we observe that there are 12 snow leopard range countries and there are 13 tiger range countries. And when we look at this 13 tiger range countries, in that you definitely have to understand India is there. Obviously, the largest population. Right? Is Pakistan there? Search, search. Ah, unna tise indi. Right? <laughs> Right? So you please refer to those 13 range countries. Ah, NCAP. Extremely important for this year. Right? Extremely important for this year. When we look at NCAP, understand some things. It fundamentally looks into reduction of PM 2.5 and PM 10. One understanding. The second thing we see is the year it was started was 2019. The base year it considered was 
2017. That is the second thing that you will have to remember with respect to NCAP. The base year it was considered was 2017 and the aspect is 2019. One more dimension that you will have to see is it is not regarding all the cities, but it talks about something called as non-attainment city. And it fundamentally talks about around 130 non-attainment cities. And what is the criteria for a particular city to be classified as non-attainment city if you observe? You see that that particular city which is breaching the national ambient air quality standards for five continuous years. When a particular city is breaching a national ambient air quality standards, NAX, national ambient air quality standards for five consecutive years, we call that particular city as a non-attainment city. And I see that in the context of the measurements or if I look at the objective way of looking at air pollution in the context of India, I see that CPCB, Central Pollution Control Board, is fundamentally an in-charge organization which is existing. And when I look at that organization, the organization talks about two different dimensions. One, it talks about National Air Quality Index. The other one, it talks about is National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Now, when I look at this National Ambient Air Quality Standards, I see that this is a set of 12 pollutants which are present. This is a set of 12 pollutants. I want you to have a look at those 12 pollutants once. Right? And when I look at that National Air Quality Index, National Air Quality Index has 8 pollutants which are present. And one common factor that you will have to understand in both of them, there is no carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not a factor in both of them. Carbon dioxide is not a gas which is considered. Carbon dioxide is not a criteria which is considered. So when you observe this in the context of NACV, in the context of NACS, I don't have carbon dioxide being present. Do we have carbon monoxide? Yes. It was a question that was asked in 2016, especially in the context of National Air Quality Index. How many categories of National Air Quality Index are there? Six categories. We see severely affected, right? Poor. Different six categories are there. Who gives this National Air Quality Index? CPCB. CPCB gives this Air Quality Index. I want you to have a look at those eight pollutants and 12 pollutants which are present, right? Now, one more thing that you will see, that the five-year assessment of NCAP is, you know, what are targets in India? Targets in India are those which are never met. Yes or no? Ante A target and A target, me targets. But suppose today you say, I will have to study for 10 hours. Do you study? There is bonus, there is concession, everything is there. And the maximum you study is what? 8 hours. By mistake, if you cross 10 hours and study for 12 hours, next day you will compensate by studying less. Right? So that's what happened. So you see that one definite remark in the context of NCAP is the targets are not met. Will they meet it in future? If you target meet the future, future will little meet. Yes or no? Because it is a backlog. It is a delay which is fundamentally existing in the target. Now, did we meet IG targets? Did we meet? Targets in smart cities? Yes or no? But we made only one target without any effort. Sorry, there was a lot of effort which was there. Population, right? The true freedom struggle. So you see, that when I talk about eco-sensitive zone, eco-sensitive zone is fundamentally derived from Environmental Protection Act, 1986. It talked about initially 10 kilometers around the protected area. And why 10 kilometers around the protected area, area? It talked about buffer state or it talked about buffer area. Now, why buffer area? Fundamentally, to absorb the shock. To absorb the shock. Whose shock? The human intervention, the anthropogenic activities and the shock that is created by the anthropogenic activities around this protected area. Now, here when I observe, then slowly what started happening is, Supreme Court came up with a judgment, Arya Babu, 10 kilometers is too much. Let's go for something smaller and it said we will have to go for uniform 1 kilometer. Now when it said uniform 1 kilometer, that means if this is the protected area, 1 kilometer around this has to be what? Eco-sensitive zone. In the recent judgment, Supreme Court came and said uniform eco-sensitive zone is not possible in India. Because nothing is uniform in India, nothing is consistent in India, nothing is steady in India, nothing is growing in India, nothing is progressive in India except... Right? We use this as one of the elimination techniques when we are fundamentally solving the question. So we see eco-sensitive zones. Now there is no condition of uniformity. There is no condition of uniformity, but it is subjected to what? It is subjected to the protected area. 
whatever is the area that is present accordingly the necessary arrangements are going to make who is going, who can declare this eco sensitive zone even a state government can declare eco sensitive zone now one small thing that you'll have to understand in the context of eco sensitive zones that means if this is the product area and if this is the eco sensitive zone which is existing i see that the activities which are undertaken in this context of eco sensitive zone can be classified into three some activities are permitted some activities are prohibited some activities are restricted that means you will have to understand that all the activities in eco sensitive zone are not prohibited some are prohibited some are permitted some are restricted when i look at this prohibited those which are polluting highly polluting in nature are prohibited for example mining activity for example your hydel powers or for example you talk about saw mills industries all of these are highly polluting in nature those which are highly polluting which are prohibited and what are permitted in this particular region my dear those which are eco friendly for example rain water harvesting systems for example sustainable agriculture all of these activities eco tourism all of these are permitted to a larger extent now there is something called as restricted activities when i look at restricted activities some kinds of research some kind of horticultural activities that means which is neither too much polluting which is neither too much eco friendly which is medium those activities are restricted remember this much that some are restricted some are prohibited some are permitted so that is one small dimension that we'll have to understand in the context of eco sensitive zones western ghats ha ah. which one by whom by gadgil committee they said all the hilly area by kasturi rangan it said around 36% Right? They did not specify any specific area, my dear. Please understand. In Kasturi Rangan, we have around 36 percent. But whereas in the context of Gadgil Committee, it is with respect to all the hilly area which is present in the context of Western Ghats. Now, when I look at this Biodiversity Act, I see that the BDA 2002. This was the original legislation. And what is the basis that I see? I see that UN CBD is the basis for BDA. and i also see an extension of un cbd is something called as nagoya protocol where i see that nagoya protocol fundamentally talks about prayer informed consent especially in the context of equitable benefit sharing equitable benefit sharing equitable benefit sharing when i look at this benefit sharing which is which is spoken by nagoya protocol i see both the monetary benefits as well as the non monetary benefits so in both of these dimensions i see the aspects of the benefit sharing and i see there has to be the necessary prayer informed consent which should be existing from those individuals who are conserving this particular ecosystem or who are conserving this biodiversity for them to share the benefits now once i understand this basic dimension i also see an extended version of this is cart gene protocol when i look at this cart gene protocol it talks about the restricted transboundary movement of lmos what are lmos living modified organisms right that is what is one fundamental thing that you'll have to see then apart from that when i look at this bda i also see it creates a three tier structure which is existing and when i observe this three tier structure it talks about nba it talks about sba it talks about your bmcs right biodiversity management committee that is nba sba and biodiversity management committees now when i look at nba nba fundamentally looks into the guidance of all of this it is hierarchical in nature and for me to look into any sort of permissions that has to be given for exploring or for exploiting or for using any biological resource the necessary permission has to be derived from nba the necessary permission has to be derived from nba we just discussed that the chairperson of nba is the secretary of ministry of environment forest and climate change now one more small thing that you will have to see in this context of nba sba now when you look at nba the necessary permission has to be given with respect to the intellectual property rights the necessary permission has to be given with respect to filing of intellectual property rights over these natural resources now when i look at this filing of intellectual property rights over these natural resources we see that in 20 or in 2002 act it talks that whenever there is an application process which is present whenever i have an application process which is present now in the context of the application process of filing for ipr i will have to have the permission of nba but when i look at 2022 act when i see the amendment it said i don't need at the application stage but i need that permission at granting stage 
प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड अप्लाइंग इज डिफरेंट ऑलवेज रिमेम्बर ऑल दो अप्लीकेशन फॉर इंटलेक्चुअल प्रॉपर्टी राइट आर नॉट रीचिंग द स्टेज ऑफ ग्रांटिंग प्लीज रिमेम्बर आफ्टर एप्लीकेशन I see one more stage called scrutiny. Right? Once I look at the scrutiny, then I'll have to have something called as proof of concept. Then, when I have this proof of concept, then on a late later stage, I see the granting of patent or granting of intellectual property right. Now, what are they saying? They are saying initially they were saying that we were we are supposed to have the NBA permission at the initial phase. But what is the recent amendment said? You don't need it at initial phase, but you want you need to have it at final stage. Anyway, so many things are going to fall off in the middle. So many things are going to be dropped in the middle. And at the final stage, at the granting stage, you need the permission. One. The second thing that it talks about is the role of BMC. When I look at this role of BMC, that is biodiversity management committees, and when I observe these biodiversity management committees, what do I see is biodiversity management committees fundamentally talks about something called as people's biodiversity registers. When you talk about this people's biodiversity registers, what do you see with respect to this people's biodiversity registers is these are fundamentally prepared by bmcs and they have to be submitted to the state governments it is a mandatory clause which is existing it's a mandatory clause which is existing and if all the state governments which do not insist these bmcs to submit pbr the supreme court said the necessary fines and the necessary impositions will be made so in that context what happened is it is a mandatory clause that is seen on the side of the bmcs to submit these pbrs to the state government one understand the second thing that you'll have to see in this context is when you talk about the aspects of bmcs and pbr for any sort of exploitation of resources for any sort of exploitation of resources that is especially the natural resources you were supposed to have something called as prayer informed consent of whom prayer informed consent of those people who are conserving these resources that was the position or that was the clause in 2002 act but what happened to this particular act is in 2022 it said there is no need of prayer informed consent there is no need of prayer informed consent from the conservators or from the people who are conserving these biological resources if it is needed the necessary permission can be directly taken from nba and the necessary exploitation or the necessary exploration of these natural resources can be taken up you don't need the prayer informed consent or you don't need the permission of the local communities who are conserving this particular resources now remember these two conditions which are extremely important when it comes to this amendment remember these two things one is the change in ipr provision the other one is the change with respect to the prayer informed consent in the context of this right now baki ka thing you don't need to bother much ah is one more which has been recently happening to a larger extent that is biodiversity heritage sites right so many are being declared as biodiversity heritage sites at one shot they declared around three in odisha and recently we see again them being declared in tamil nadu region so when we look at this biodiversity heritage sites we see that biodiversity heritage sites are fundamentally declared by state governments they are fundamentally declared by state governments and the necessary conservation that has to be undertaken in the context of the biodiversity heritage sites where we see the state governments can has a consultation with the local communities the necessary conservation has to happen by the state government in consultation with local communities one one more thing that if you see that you also need to have the consultation of the state government with the central government especially when it comes to establishing the necessary rules in management of the biodiversity heritage sites so that is one small thing that you'll have to understand here one is conservation process has to happen in consultation with local communities the rules process has to happen in consultation with central government right so that is one more dimension that you will have to remember baki then nallur tamarind groove nallur tamarind groove was the first biodiversity heritage site how many biodiversity heritage sites are there in india today around 44 around 44 around 44 biodiversity heritage sites are there in india today right Mm. Now observe these forest legislations. Now, when I look at this forest legislation, what is happening is I see majorly in the context of India, I see three kinds of legislations to be dominant. One is Indian Forest Act, nineteen 
1927. The other one is Forest Conservation Act, 1980, now being amended in 2023. Then we see Forest Rights Act, 2006. Now, when I observe this Indian Forest Act 1927, what do I majorly see? It is fundamentally a move to consolidate all of the forest regulations and legislations of the British government. The first thing. The second thing that you will have to observe in the context of Indian Forest Act is it classifies forest. It classifies forest into what? It classifies forest into reserve forest, protected forest, and village forest. It classifies forest into reserve forest, protected forest, and village forest. And when you observe this classification of reserve forest, protected forest, and village forest, what do you see? Is the necessary classification has a variation in the context of degree of protection. I see a necessary variation existing in the context of degree of protection. And I observe that the reserve forest is more protected than the protected forest, which is more protected than village forest. And one more small thing that you will have to see in the context of Indian Forest Act is it talks about forest section officer. You see the appointment of forest section officer by the necessary state government. And you see this forest section officer is going to look into the movement of the individuals into the forest. And we also see that Indian Forest Act talks about the criminal offenses which are made by the movement of the individuals or movement of the trespassers into the forest. You know that trespassing into forest is a criminal offense. Right? You can't move into this forest region. What is going to happen? They will come and catch you and take. Right? Not for engaging in the process of evolution. But they will take you for trespassing. Please remember this. Right? The next thing is that we see Forest Conservation Act 1980. One small thing that you have to understand in the context of Forest Conservation Act 1980 is it talks about the diversion of forest lands into non-forest usage. Diversion of forest land into non-forest usage. And when I look at this diversion of forest into non-forest usage, what do I commonly observe is I see that there are two ways of diverting or two ways of compensating the loss of forest because of the diversion into non-forest use. And when I look at these two ways, one is either I talk about something called as compensatory or forestation. Either I talk about something called as compensatory of forestation or I talk about the necessary monetary compensation. And when I look at this compensatory of forestation, that means when I look at this compensatory of forestation, for how much ever land is being diverted for non-forest use, that much amount of land has to be gone for a forestation somewhere else, irrespective of the region in which you are going to go for a forestation, but definitely you need that a forestation, one dimension. But when I look at the second dimension that I see, monetary compensation, in the context of monetary compensation, I need not go for direct afforestation mechanism, but I can fund that afforestation uh, through what? Monetary compensation. And what is the value on which I'm going to calculate this monetary compensation? There is something called as net present value. There is something called as net present value of a particular forest area or a particular forest region upon which I see this calculation of the monetary compensation goes on. And when I talk about this net present value, which is calculated, mostly I see that in the context of net present value, it talks about or it calculates the amount of the area of forest. It not only calculates the amount or area of forest, but it also calculates the component called as ecosystem services, which are being provided by that particular forest. We know that forest is nothing but an ecosystem. And I know that any kind of ecosystem can have four different kinds of ecosystem services, which are being provided. One particular kind of service is provisioning service, regulating service, supporting service, and cultural service. So when I look at these four different kinds of services which are being provided, I will have to consider both of them when I'm considering the, this net present value. And when I talk about this net present value, why am I calculating this net present value? For monetary compensation. And where is this monetary compensation going? This is going to something called as CAMPA fund. We see there is a legislation which has been, which has come up with respect to CAMPA fund in 2016. And when I look at the composition of CAMPA fund, I observe that in the context of the CAMPA fund, I see that the CAMPA fund is fundamentally to be put under public accounts of India. It is not under consolidated fund of India. It is put under public accounts of India. And I see this CAMPA fund, 90% of the CAMPA fund goes to the state, but whereas the 10% of the CAMPA fund goes to center. 90% goes to the state and 10% goes to the center. 
and this is put under public accounts of india 2019 there was a question which was being asked on campa fund right please understand that now this is with respect to fca forest conservation act now when i look at forest rights act i see that in the context of forest rights act i observe that forest rights act fundamentally has two different stakeholders which are existing one is the scheduled tribes the other one is other traditional forest dwellers one is the scheduled tribes the other one is the other traditional forest dwellers and i also observe that it has a condition that the individual should be existing there for at least three generations or the individual should be existing there for at least 75 years such that whatever is the time period for this individual to be considered as a native of that forest can maximum have an access of how much four hectares of land four hectares of land can be the maximum land titling or the land rights this individual can derive from the other dimension that we will have to understand here that the land which is granted to an individual who has been living in that forest area for three generations or 75 years can only be transferred or can only be inherited it can never be transferred to an individual who is belonging to other family it can never be sold it can never be mortgaged remember the only thing that can be done with this land is what matter it can only be inherited it can only be inherited and apart from that who is the focal entity in the context of managing of forest rights act it is the gram sabha which is existing there and we also observe that there are four different kinds of forest rights which are existing in this context of forest rights act one particular rights that i see are the land rights i see the land rights the second thing that i see is with respect to conservation rights they have the rights for conservation right they have the rights for conservation and we know pakke tiger reserve existing in arunachal pradesh is categorically known for something called as conservation cultural conservation models we talk about something called as community conservation models or cultural conservation models which are seen with respect to pakke tiger reserve where is pakke tiger reserve pakke is a tribe in arunachal pradesh then we have another kind is the minor forest produce rights they have the right for right minor forest produce and not only that the other right which is existing is it not only talks about the individual rights but it also talks about community forest rights it not only talks about the individual forest rights but it also talks about the community forest right so i see that these are the four different kinds of forest rights which are fundamentally existing and which are covered under fra 2006 right ah what did they bring in with respect to this amendment one small change they brought in was they made it little more flexible ande kada amma generally right wings are favorable to whom capitalist section that means any change which is happening to the environmental legislations what is my generalization that i remember that it is made more favorable for business rather than conservation now when it is made more favorable for business rather than conservation will the provisions be more stringent or will they be more flexible they are more flexible you look at ngt you look at fca you look at bda or you look at eia environmental impact assessment in environmental impact assessment what happened my dear fundamentally the window for public review or the public opinion has been reduced and they gave number of exemptions when it comes to the projects so that means they are favoring whom my dear business remember the simple generalization i think whatever is the statement that is being asked it can be answered theek okay. hai next state of birds report it is given by whom ha huh? చెప్పండి బర్డ్ లైఫ్ ఇంటర్నేషనల్ లా థర్టీన్ నాన్ ప్రాఫిట్ ఆర్గనైజేషన్ విల్ కంపైల్ సంథింగ్ కాల్ స్టేట్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా బర్డ్ రిపోర్ట్ నెక్స్ట్ దిస్ ఇస్ ఏషియన్ వాటర్ బర్డ్ సెన్సస్ ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ త్రీ నా ఇన్ దిస్ ఏషియన్ వాటర్ బర్డ్ సెన్సస్ ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ త్రీ వీ మేజర్లీ సీ వాట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ కంపైల్డ్ బై హూమ్ మై డియర్ బై సమ్ వాలంటీర్స్ by some volunteers across which all places across asia and what is this australia or australasia australasian region what is australasian region ha huh? pan pacific beautiful australasian region is a pan pacific region right then when we look at this we see there are three organizations which are present one is with respect to international water bird census the other one is wetland international the other one is wetland international right so this is one small thing that you will have to understand does it cover all the flyways no it covers only east asian and also it also covers central asian 
India comes under which of these flyways? India is part of Central Asian flyway. India is part of Central Asian flyway, right? Now, that is what we discussed here, flyways. Please refer to this, nothing much to be discussed. Next, ah, World Air Quality Report. Now, generally what happens according to World Air Quality Report, is India among top five? No. Yes, sir. Nunte ne naasalit bette wani gora gadu. Yendu ko obvious that is. Ona? Yes. I am very very happy to declare because of that fellow. Which all countries? Hindi. Ah. What? Chadda. Hindi. Chat. Chat. Ah, okay. Here, okay. Me is right. Next, Iraq, Pakistan, Bahrain, then Bangladesh. Is India there in the top five? Not there. But look at the irony. In the top fifty cities, India has thirty cities. See, thirty or that? Yeah. Yendu ko right. Thirty nine cities are. Polluted here in this context, right? So that is one small thing that you'll have to understand. Okay. Is this clear? Just remember this much. Who gives this? IQ. IQ Air. It's a Swiss organization. IQ Air. It's a Swiss organization which gives this particular report. Next. Invasive alien species in India. Lanthana camera is there. Prosopis chilinensis. And Prosopis julifora, Prosopis julifora, 2018 PYQ, right? Then Caribbean false mussels. So here, one small difference that you'll have to find between these two. Both are Prosopis species. When I look at Chilensis, this is drought species, or this is dry species, and this is present in marshy regions. Prosopis julifora is a marshy region species, but whereas when I talk about Prosopis chilenensis, it is present in dry regions, right? And who gives you this report which is related to invasive species? Last year, 2023 question, option B, IUC and option A was what? UNEP, right? Ah. Misty scheme, misty scheme is regarding whom? Mangroves lo M mundi, Mamadi Totalu, Misty's lo M mundi. Are they called Mamadi Totalu? Or they are called as Mada Adubulu. They are Mada Adubulu. Right? That is mangroves. Now, what is the speciality of mangroves? When I describe mangroves, how do I describe? I describe mangroves as a halophytic substance, as a urihaline, as a halophytic substance, as a urihaline. And I also see it is an ecotonic species. It is an ecotonic species which is existing. I know that ecotone is what matter. It's a transitionary region which is existing between two different forms of ecosystem. And what is a characteristic feature that is present? I call it mangroves as edge species. I call mangrove as edge species because I see edge effect being present in the transitionary region. And what is a characteristic feature of edge effect? I see edge effect is all about what? Edge effect is when I see more amount of biodiversity being seen in the transitionary regions than the surrounding areas. That is what is called as edge effect. And mangroves is a manifestation. Mangroves is a testimonial for edge species. And when I observe the special characteristic features which are existing in the context of mangroves, I see that there are multiple special features. One is present. One is what is called as pneumatophores. I know pneumatophores are leaves or roots. They are roots. I see something called as stilt roots are also there. Then I see succulent leaves. I see succulent leaves and these succulent leaves are majorly what? These are salt secreting in nature. Succulent leaves are salt secreting in nature because I see that there is abundance of saline condition which is present in this particular context. Then apart from that, I see one more condition which is present that is pneumatophores, stilt roots, succulent leaves. That is the special characteristic feature. One more is what, my dear? Viviparity. Viviparity is one more condition which is existing. So, all of these are what? All of these are the factors which are present with respect to a mangrove species. Right? To conserve this mangrove species, what is happening? I have something called as MISTI program. And when I look at the statistics of the status of mangroves in the context of India, I keep telling, according to ISFR report, it is around 4992 square kilometers. It is around 
0.15 percentage of geographical area and when we look at what is the amount of area that is covered in whole of asia or the proportion of mangroves in india with respect to asia around 3 percentage of the mangroves that is present in asia is present in india and when i look at the some of the important mangrove structures that are existing in the context of india is what bitarganika sundarbans largest is what sundarbans sundarbans is the largest mangroves in the world yes or no and it is the only mangrove structures which has tiger population bengal tiger yes so i see that sundarbans bitarganika poringa pichavaram ratnagiri all of these are what some of the mangrove structures which are commonly observed in the context of india and when i observe one peculiar technique which is existing in the context of regrowth or conservation of mangroves in forestry we study one particular technique called as herring bone technique we study something called as herring bone technique or it is also called as a fish bone technique and when i observe this herring bone technique or fish bone technique what do i commonly see that i have some structures like this where i see the central channel i have the water being moving and this is the place where i have the seedlings of the mangroves being planted right so it is looking like a fish bone that is why it is what is called as herring bone technique right it is what is called as herring bone or fish bone so this is one small dimension that you will have to understand in the context of misty now look at the funding mechanism we see 80% of the project is by center and 20% is by whom my dear state next same initiative again this is for shrimp cultivation vis a vis the mangroves shrimp cultivation vis a vis the mangroves right so that is one dimension that you will have to understand now tell me one more thing are mangroves an efficient carbon sink yes they are efficient carbon sinks please remember this mangroves are efficient carbon sinks then indian mangroves i think those things that i have have just mentioned and some more aspects are there with respect to the mangroves for future mangrove climate alliance that is all there now when i look at this global forest watch i see the global forest watch is being given by world resource institute wri global forest watch is being given by world resource institute and when i observe this i see the highest tropical forest cover loss is seen in brazil then drc it is seen in brazil then in drc right write down some data regarding isfr if you want to write indian state of forest report शायद मैंने बोला था ना आई आई गिव यू द डेटा यू वांट और यू वांट मी टू पोस्ट इट ऑन द ग्रुप बोलो बोलो हां व्हाट एवर हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू वांट मी टू डिक्टेट हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू वांट मी टू पोस्ट इट ऑन द ग्रुप ओके आई विल पोस्ट इट ऑन द ग्रुप होप यू नो आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट व्हिच ग्रुप राइट हां तो दोस हु डोंट नो व्हाट शुड आई डू those who don't know ah those who don't know dictate telivi telivi ha are right if some days pass by you will even tell come and write the exam right dada na kem sambandham ledhu na camera all pettukodala avani naaku teliyadu right some people are experts right i am not chicken chaala mandi ki ardham galedu meeku ardham gaagapodame manchidi right right because you have excellent understanding capacities kada <laughs> national dolphin research center ndrc now when i talk about this national dolphin research center this was the first national dolphin research center where in india where is it established in bihar right there also dolphins will be red what is the status of dolphin endangered endangered dolphin right is it endemic species to india it's not endemic right does dolphins live only in fresh water yes no are they omnivores herbivores carnivores omnivores remember right just because don dolphin looks cute don't say it is herbivores sir dolphin is vegan sir right it eats only tofu no right please okay <laughs> dolphin is omnivores right then one more thing it works on the principle called as echolocation what do you understand by echolocation you have some technology called as sonar you have heard no what is sonar that you send a beam of sound and what happens you get that reflection and depending upon the 
intensity of the reflection, you judge the distance, right? You judge the distance. You have different kinds of technologies. One is sonar, one is radar, one is LIDAR. All these are there. In sonar, we use sound. In radar, we use radio waves. In LIDAR, we use light, visible light, right? Ah. Leopard population, yes. What is the status of leopard? Vulnerable. The status of leopard is vulnerable. When we look at the population of leopard, we see Madhya Pradesh has the highest, followed by Maharashtra, followed by Karnataka. Karnataka, so our blank got filled. It was what? Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Uttarakhand for tiger. What was for elephant? Karnataka, Assam and Kerala. For leopard, it is MMK. What is MMK? Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Annitlo Karnataka on. Avanagada. Karnataka people happy? MKU, KK, MMK. Right? Then on a later date, we will add one more set to this that is snow leopard. We will have to remember these four at any cost. Because in 2020, there was a four statement based question which was given with respect to elephants. And in the last statement, it said the highest population of elephants is in Assam or Kerala, something they have given. Where is the highest population of elephants being present? Karnataka. If you were able to eliminate that statement, you were able to arrive at the answer. Right? Ah, okay, good. Now, what is the status of leopard? Vulnerable, I told you, it is the smallest of the big cats. What was the smallest of the turtles? Olive Ridley turtles. Smallest of the turtles was Olive Ridley. Smallest of the cats is leopards. Then we have Ipka, IBCA, extremely important again for this year. Are sal tiger ke bina cat species ke bina tumara paper hoga bhi nahi. Right? Please remember, definitely you will have a question on cat species. Which cat species? Huh? Big cat. Big cat, right? So definitely be ready with this. Ipka, it's an initiative. And what is the speciality of Ipka? The speciality of the Ipka is the headquarters is in India, right? Where is the headquarters of ISA, International Solar Alliance? India. 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 Please remember this, right? Then we see, when we talk about the Cats which are covered here, we have seven, which all are there? Tiger, lion, leopard, snow leopard, cheetah, jaguar, puma. Right? Now we are very, very familiar with tiger, lion, leopards, snow leopards, cheetah. Are these two present in India? Are these two present in India? Remember this way. That punch, we are all very, very familiar. Cheetah, why? Again, reintroduced. Leopard, we just saw census. Right, what is the order? MMK. Snow leopard. Census were there for the first time. Lion. Asiatic lion to hai. How many countries are there in this? 97 countries. 97 countries are there. Right? Where is its headquarters? India. What is the funding mechanism here? Majorly, it is common pool resources. Majorly, it is common pool resources. Just because head, headquarters is in India, we see a $100 million grant being given by India. headquarters India alone. India headquarters How many countries are there? 97 countries are there. Right? Beautiful. Ah. There is one report which is being given, Living Animal Species Rules. This has been established under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Just remember, this particular rules are established by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and with respect to whom? Wildlife Protection Act. Next. Ah. Bannihat was considered to be the most polluted city in India. Now, don't say most polluted city in India is Delhi, but it is now Barnihat, right? Basically, this is in the border regions of Meghalaya and Assam. Right? Ah. Next. Biodiversity be national jurisdiction. Now, you know that when I look at any postal administration, 
what do i see in the context of coastal administration is i see those waters which are present very very close to the boundary is what are called as internal waters or what are called as internal waters and i see that the jurisdiction of internal waters are majorly with respect to state and i see the marine police force the state marine police force sometimes central marine police force is going to look after the internal waters and when i move for 12 nautical miles from the boundary i have one particular these are water called as territorial waters 12 nautical miles from the boundary is what is called as territorial waters and majorly i see the administration of territorial waters is by indian coast guard and when i move for 22 nautical miles when i move for 22 nautical miles that is this is what is called as contiguous region this is what is called as contiguous region and i see this contiguous region being administered majorly by again indian coast guard and i see that from here i see 200 nautical miles the 200 nautical miles is what is going to be ez exclusive economic zones and in the context of exclusive economic zones i see the convergence of administration convergence of management between indian coast guard as well as indian navy indian coast guard as well as indian navy both of them are going to be there in the context of exclusive economic zone management and those regions which are present beyond this 200 nautical miles are what are called as high seas and these high seas are managed by whom my dear indian navy these high seas are managed by indian navy now in this context they were trying to look into the conservation of the biodiversity that is existing in the high seas region and that is where we talk about high seas gt and what is this we have something called as un clause right united nations convention on the law of the seas right united united nations convention on law of the seas un clause is what is going to look into majorly the administration that is regarding your marine resources as well as this and we have something called as international sea bed authority now when we have this international sea bed authority international sea bed authority is one of the wings of un clause is one of the wings of un clause so please understand this now one more small thing that you will have to see look at the last line the two thirds of the global oceans is what is majorly present in high seas right two thirds of the global oceans is majorly present in high seas but only 1.5 percentage of the high seas are protected right it, this fundamentally shows what that means when i look at this marine resources where are they majorly present more than 66% of them are present in high seas but how much percentage of this high seas are only protected 1.5% that is the reason why we are talking about high seas treaty that is the reason why we are talking about high seas treaty where is the secretariat present belgium the secretariat for high seas treaty is in belgium right so that is that is one small understanding that you need to have ye to fra ka hai aap log dekha hai next cms yesterday we had we had been referring to cms do you remember we were discussing about one particular duck last may yes i told you can duck be a migratory species i told you migratory species can be avian terrestrial and and aquatic as well so what is that convention which is looking into this the convention which is looking into this is convention on migratory species and this is otherwise called as bonn convention and when i look at this the 14th conference of parties happened in samarkand region it happened in samarkand there were number of additions which were being made one particular addition that was made was 14 migratory species were added it in this particular region in this particular convention or in this particular conference of parties then apart from that we also have something called as global partnership on ecological connectivity has been coming up here then we also have one health central asian project now when i talk about one health central asian project or when you observe this one health central asian project what do you see here we don't have all the central asian countries being present but we only have five central asian countries being present in this context right so we have one health central asian project then apart single species action plan we also have single species action plan which has come up in the context of the conference of parties cms now one more small thing that you have to understand that in sites we generally have three appendix one appendix one appendix two and appendix three depending upon the levels of endanger that is present or the how much ever the species is endangered it is going to be accordingly arranged in the context of cms we see that in cms we have two appendix one appendix one and appendix two appendix one and appendix two now 
what is the variation in the context of appendix 1 this is more endangered migratory species are placed in appendix 1 less endangered are placed in appendix 2 now one small question that i want to put to you is can any conference of party amend this appendix can it amend amending means what changing it can amend yes the second thing is can it take away the species from this appendix yes no anything can be done yes please remember modification will include either inclusion of a species into this appendix or not only the inclusion of a species into this appendix but also taking away the species from the appendix i can either include or i can either take away the species from this appendix what is the inclusion the example that i just told you that 14 new species were being added to one of the appendix please understand this next nitrogen pollution right nitrogen pollution we know different kinds of pollutions will lead in different diseases cadmium will result in which kind of disease etai etai arsenic will result in what black foot disease lead will result in what carcinogenic it is cancerous cancerous right then mercury will result in what minamata disease minamata disease mercury your nitrates will result in what blue baby syndrome the nitrates will result in blue baby syndrome so cadmium will result in etai etai nitrates will result in blue baby arsenic will result in black foot then lead will result in carcinogenic and mercury will result in minamata disease now once i understand this i see that when i talk about nitrogen pollution majorly i see that nitrogen pollution majorly is seen from agriculture i see majorly nitrogen pollution being present from agriculture and not only from agriculture but i also have the anthropogenic emissions being the reason for nitrogen pollution and how does this nitrogen pollution become a problem in the context of water pollution is i know the whole of your neutro eutrophication problem was what my dear majorly adding nitrogen majorly adding nitrogen why was this nitrogen being added because of the agricultural runoff which was being present in this particular region and when i have this agricultural runoff which is being added what is going to happen because of this agricultural runoff i see that all of the nitrates and nitrogen is going to be added to this water body which was resulting in the pollution is agricultural runoff a point source of pollution or non point source of pollution on point source of pollution are you understanding that is why it is talking about the global water scarcity ah seven world restoration flagships now they talked about restoration why restoration because this is the decade of ecological restoration this is the decade of ecological restoration the un general assembly declared it as decade of ecological restoration that is 2021 to 2030 is declared as decade of ecological restoration and because of this they are talking about seven in seven different kinds of restorations at the different regions you don't need to remember those regions but just remember who are the parties who are present now it is majorly it is unep and fao who are indulged in this how many initiatives named seven initiatives in which all regions my dear is it all over the world or only specific regions specific regions africa latin america mediterranean region and southeast asian region latin america africa mediterranean and southeast asia who are the parties here unep and fao right ah snow leopard snow leopard species now we see totally how many snow leopards are there 718 highest is in ladakh then uttarakhand followed by himachal so again i am writing the whole of our sequence tigers with respect to mku m is what madhya pradesh karnataka and uttarakhand elephants with respect to kak karnataka assam and kerala leopards with respect to mmk madhya pradesh maharashtra and karnataka snow leopards with respect to luh ladakh uttarakhand and himachal ladakh uttarakhand and himachal i remember these four sequences 
right now you don't need to remember more than 3 why because if i remember first 3 if there are four options given i can definitely say that whichever is remaining is the fourth one now if i remember 3 if 5 are given definitely i can arrange the remaining two if i know the first three right please understand this so this is what is the sequence that is existing here now i think in snow leopard we will have 12 snow leopard range countries in tiger how many range countries 13 in snow leopard 12 range countries these are the 12 range countries in this we have pakistan unfortunately yes we have china definitely yes we have india yes right next in india which all region jammu and kashmir ladakh uttarakhand arunachal pradesh sikkim himachal wherever we have majorly himalayan systems himalayan structures wherever we know there is snow that is present i have snow leopard and then right can i have snow leopard in telangana it will not be snow leopard it will be heat leopard why telangana is known for what heat waves yes or no it is known for heat waves ah impact i been i been last right what is impact international marine protected area congress it is with respect to what conservation of oceanic species conservation of oceanic species state of cryosphere report it is given by whom international cryosphere climate initiative right most of the times when we see this option as option a first we will strike it why will we strike it we will strike it because examiner is trying to play with me here it is cryosphere here it is cryosphere he is playing he is playing with me i will not be cheated you can't cheat me okay he is and finally what will happen you are cheated so in that context what you are supposed to do please remember cryosphere report is given by whom international cryosphere climate initiative very good the last one you feeling sad malare chudalsinde nan appa right mars methane alert and response system right mars it is by whom unep most of the initiatives that we have seen is by whom em gurtu rakapothe em pettesa ravali unep edo okati right ochind ante rendu poyind ante ante right you should not be worried about this now if i see i know if something related to green if something related to data and all what do i do i have a generalization called european union history lo em telikapothe gandhi gandhi kachithanga telusu avuna kada that's how the examiner will also work don't you think so we'll discuss don't worry 16th and 17th wala sessions we will enjoy them theek hai so this was initiated in which one 27th conference cop in egypt 26th was where glasgow 27 egypt 28 dubai remember those remember some of the important ones cop 3 is important you want a list ah liklo liklo cop 13 is important cop 16 is important cop 21 is important cop 25 is important 26 is important 27 is important and 28 Now, which was the COP? Was there any COP which was conducted in India? Which year? 2014 or 13? Which COP was that? COP? Which year? 2002. Very good. It was COP 8, right? Now remember, UN CBD, UN CCD, UNF Triple C, all of these were conducted in India. The conference of parties regarding UN CBD, UN CCD, and UNF Triple C, all of them were conducted in India. When was UN CCD conducted? 2022. Around 2022, yes, 14th. 
I think 14th COP of UN CCT was conducted Delhi declaration. That is a place where we talked about land degradation neutrality, LDN. Remember all of these COPs. Was CMS conducted in India? The Convention on Migratory Species. The 12th CMS was in Gandhi Nagar. E Gandhi Nagar Gadu. Gujarat Gandhi Nagar. Right? E Gandhi Nagar lay under the A one of the only Karu in Leh. Right? 12th CMS or 12th COP was conducted in Gandhi Nagar. Take Ah. Oh, it's done. It's done. Is it done? When I look at WLPA, it has a lot of institutional base. One institution it talks about is NBW, CZA, Central Zoo Authority. Then NBW is National Board for Wildlife, who is it is which is headed by Prime Minister. Then I have something called as a Chief Wildlife Warden. Then I have NTCA, National Tiger. Conservation Authority coming from this. Yes. And I have one more organization coming from this. WCCB, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. I see Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. I, I see NTCA. I see Chief Wildlife Warden. I see CZA and I see NBW coming all of this from WLPA. If they are coming from a particular law, they are statutory organizations or executive statutory positions. They are statutory organizations which are present. The next thing that I see is there are a number of positions in the context of conservation. When it comes to conservation, I see a demarcation that is existing between 1972 and 2022 legislation. I know that this particular legislation was amended. And when I look at this conservation in the context of 1972 legislation, I see that there were six schedules which were existing. And in this six schedules, I know that one first schedule is the, I mean, it is the maximum protected. Then followed by second schedule, followed by third schedule, followed by fourth schedule. And I see that what is the variation that is existing with respect to first, second, and third, and fourth. It is fundamentally with respect to, fundamentally with respect to what? The degree of conservation that is present. But in this 1972 legislation, I had a fifth schedule where it talked about vermin species. Where it talked about a vermin species, where a particular state can notify a vermin species and the necessary permission has to be given by the center. And who is going to declare a particular species as a vermin species? The central government is going to declare a particular species as vermin species that is according to 1972 legislation. And what is this talking about? It is talking about sixth schedule and when I look at the sixth schedule, it talks about the plant species which cannot be planted. They can never be planted or you need necessary permission for them to be planted. You need permission. 2020 PYQ. In 2020, there was one question. Sixth schedule of the Wildlife Protection Act. Talks about what? Right? There was a confusion that was existing between option A and option B. They can never be planted or they can be planted with the necessary permission. The answer is they can be planted with necessary permission. So that is one dimension that you will have to understand. Now slowly what started happening is when you look at 2022 legislation amendment. I see that the six was reduced to four schedules. Six schedules was reduced to four schedules. Now in this context, what do I see? I see one and two schedule talking about animals as well as plants. One and two schedules talking about animals as well as plants, not only with respect to animals as well as plants, I also see there is a variation that is existing with respect to degree of protection. I see that those species which are present in schedule one are maximum protected. But those species which are present in Schedule 2 is little lesser protected than Schedule 1. That is one dimension that I see. The other thing that I see in this context is when I talk about, when I look at third schedule, I see that third schedule is especially with respect to plant species. Third schedule is especially with respect to plant species. Just like previously how we had a sixth schedule, 6 by 2 is what? 3. So Schedule 3 is plant species. That is one dimension that we will have to understand. Apart from that, one specific addition that happened was Schedule 4, that is, which is related to the sites species, which is related to site species. And in the context of sites, it is especially with respect to Washington Convention, which looks into the prevention of the trade of endangered species, which looks into the prevention of the trade of endangered species. How many appendix I have? Three. Appendix 1, Appendix 2, Appendix 3. Now, once I understand this basic dimension here, 
one more small change that was brought in when it comes to the conservation dimension especially with respect to the species of elephant previously the movement of the elephant was only known for religious activity now they did not tell it is only for religious activity but it can also be moved for general purpose and what is the condition they laid down the general condition they laid down in the context of the movement of the elephant is you need the necessary permissions if you have the necessary permissions you can move it not only for religious but also not only for temple activities but also for general activities that is one dimension you would have seen no most of the circuses stopped using elephants once upon a time telsu kada case right so in that that is one more change and what is one more change they have removed schedule 5 what was schedule 5 my dear the schedule 5 was vermin species initially the state should notify and tell to the central government are babu please declare the species as vermin species but after amendment what has happened in the context of 2022 amendment in 2022 amendment all of the power to declare it as vermin species was given to the central government there was no provision which was present there was no provision which was present there was no categorical or there was no explicit provision which was present when it comes to vermin species just like how we had in schedule 5 in 2022 there was no explicit provision which was present with respect to which was present with, with respect to what vermin species so this is one small understanding that you need to have in the context of wildlife protection act one more thing that you'll have to see it talks about various conservation mechanisms and when it talks about various conservation mechanisms most of the in situ conservation mechanisms happen on the basis of this particular legislation one kind of thing is national parks the other one is wildlife sanctuaries the other one is conservation reserves the other one is community reserves these are the four categorical or explicit mechanisms of conservation which has been mentioned by wildlife protection and when i look at this national parks which are present i know that national parks are known to have highest degree of protection and i also know that there is no human activity which is allowed in the context of national parks there is no sort of grass there is no sort of grazing there is no sort of tourist activities which can be taken place but when i look at this wildlife sanctuaries what do i commonly observe in the context of wildlife sanctuaries i see that there is a partial human activity which is permitted and who is going to give you the necessary permissions with respect to this human activity chief wildlife warden is going to be giving you necessary permissions then when i look at this community reserves and when i look at this conservation reserves in this context of community reserves and conservation reserves please understand the small difference that is existing when i look at conservation reserves these are declared by the state government these are declared by the state government and when i look at this conservation reserves these are majorly declared as the buffer regions around the protected areas the conservation reserves are declared as the buffer regions around the protected areas that means if this is a protected area around this particular region if some region is declared by the state government that happens to be conservation reserve why are they declaring this as conservation reserve just to absorb the shock because of the anthropogenic activity which is existing in the fringe regions of this protected area and when i look at this community reserves in the context of the community reserve i see that most of the conservation that happens in the context of community reserve is what my dear it is voluntary in nature when i say it is voluntary in nature what do i commonly understand in the context of voluntary in nature i see as it is voluntary what do you understand that means the community is voluntarily giving the land for the conservation to whom to the state government to the state government that means when a community is voluntarily giving the land for the protection to the state government will the rights of the community be at stake no please understand that is the rights of the community were at stake because it being declared as conservation or it it being declared as community reserve will the community give any land no so that means it's a voluntary provision for conservation and it is being maintained by whom state governments are their rights at, are the right are the rights denied no their rights are as it is they are intact and one more small thing that we see here in the context of wildlife protection act is with respect to trophy hunting there is one provision called as trophy hunting now trophy hunting according to the legislation of wildlife protection act is completely banned it is completely banned in the context of india trophy hunting for example you see no the tusks of the elephant the horn of the rhino right the claws of the tiger right puli gorlu enugu dantalu all of these are what trophies right all these are trophies right avuna kada avuna kada 
జింక జర్మం పులి జర్మం అవునా కదా రైట్ సో ఇన్ దట్ కాంటెక్స్ వాట్ హాపెన్స్ ఇన్ ఇండియా దే ఆర్ కన్సిడర్ టు బి క్రిమినల్ అఫెన్సెస్ నా హియర్ యూ ఆల్సో హ్యావ్ టు అండర్స్టాండ్ వన్ మోర్ థింగ్ దాట్ an animal can be killed in india but in what condition it can be killed ama animal ante me chicken goat avi gaadu right avu elago samputaru oddanna meer samputaru adu vere vishayam right those animals which are existing in wild those animals which are existing in wild can be killed under one condition the condition is that if that animal starts imposing a kind of threat over the human existence if it is acting as a if it is going to be a threat to the human existence it can be killed and that particular process of killing an animal which is considered to be an threat is what is called as culling process culling process is what matter killing of an animal which is which is imposing a sort of threat to the human existence can you declare it as a threat no you can't say i will declare this as threat and i will kill all of the female candidates will start declaring cockroaches as definitely threat species so apude em avutadi cockroaches will go extinct can they go right i don't know theek hai right <laughs> what happens here the chief wildlife warden has to declare a particular species as threat this was what was the catch point that was asked in 2022 in 2022 there was one question which was asked with respect to killing according to wildlife protection act 1972 it was a three statement based question in the third statement it said what that an animal can be killed with the mere apprehension that it is acting as a threat they used a word in the third statement of that particular question mere apprehension just because it is i mean it's derived out of an apprehension apprehension ante entamma illusion right teliyani bhayam will be like what ore azamu lagettu right apprehension apprehension of what apprehension that a particular species is turning into a threat you just because on the basis of apprehension you cannot kill an animal then on what basis can you kill an animal what basis the chief wildlife warden has to declare it as threat then you can kill can you kill or the forest administration will kill forest administration please and you can't take the liberty is this clear right tomorrow we will discuss the map pointing in environment national parks tiger reserves wetlands then some places in news tomorrow we will look at one dimension is the map pointing the second dimension that we will look at is the new terminologies which have emerged in environment because every year we see one or the other question coming from terms so terminologies in environment oka vela emi telikapothe ela answer pettalo annadi rep cheptanu thank you my dear we'll meet tomorrow